Hail rain, a fair maid with gold upon your toe. Open up the west gate and let the old year go. Hail rain for a fair maid with gold upon your chin. Open up the east gate and let the new year in. Live you sing, live you sing the water and the wine. The seven bright gold wires and candles that do shine. The trifold identity of Bridget is independent. Healing needs the power of fire to burn away impurities. Artistic inspiration requires the beauty of the well or natural water. The third face of Bridget, along with her images of pouring water or singing song, finds her pounding in a forge. This is Bridget, the smith. The smith needs water to temper the steel after it has been forged, but also needs a bardic spirit to inspire the shape of the work to be done in the forge. Bridget is a guardian of each of these distinct areas, but perhaps her most important guardianship is where they all meet. Fire is pure, air and water may become polluted and earth can become barren, but fire cannot be tainted and still exists. Its vulnerability is distinct from its elemental counterparts in that only fire can be extinguished in an instant whereas others cannot. For the Celts, fire was immaterial, immortal, mystery. Its presence was dangerous and yet vital to technology that would launch and support their civilization. Fire demanded the same reverence of water and the arts and was yet another jurisdiction of Bridget. Reverence for fire likely originated in reverence for the sun. The four major Celtic holidays are aligned with the sun's annual patterns in honour of their link to the agricultural cycle. The primordial fire of the sun, whose influence was vital to crop fertility and food production, was seen as a miraculous entity. As was the case of many natural phenomena, the Celts had not one god or goddess of the sun, but several. They also worshipped gods who were more associated with the uses of natural phenomena than being actual deities of it. In Britain, where Brig was called Brigantia, she was probably not considered a goddess who bore the identity of the sun itself. Yet, in her later carved depictions, she wore a crown which much that looked very much like. After their arrival in Britain, the Romans linked Brigantia with their own goddess, Sullus, in, a, in addition to Minerva. In these guises, Brigantia is not only purveyor of the sun's bounty, but an actual embodiment of the celestial body. The Earth's foliage transmutates the energy of the sun into flora and fauna. A goddess of the land would not be far removed from the image of the sun. Bridget was said to shoot flame from her skull, possibly a very old image as indicated with her British Brigantia face with the flaming sun crown. Fire worship was a cornerstone of Celtic practice and perpetual fires were kept in druidic altars in places of worship. As lovely this image may seem, druidic fire worship wasn't necessarily pretty. Some druidic rites were thought to have included a giant man-shaped contraption made of wicker, the legendary and infamous Winkerman. 
was supposed to be stuffed with live animals and people, set a fire to honour a Celtic sun god named Bealtaine, and encouraging the fertility of the soil on the early days of May. According to the Roman contemporaries, the Druids supposedly watched the death throes of the sacrificed humans and animals for divinatory signs about the temperament of the gods, and how they might be appeased. Roman explorers wrote about the practice in panic detail, likely because the Roman captured soldiers were favoured sacrificial choice. Later on we will look at these practices, but in the meantime, questions about the Wicker Man have furrowed brows of historians and archaeologists for ages. How did such a giant structure stay upright? And how did so much burn so efficiently in an area of the world and time of the year known for abundant dampness? Ancient writers did not leave these answers in their stories, and yet the lore is firmly entrenched in a collective conscience. However, it was revered, fire had power. Flame held mystery, the naturally dangerous yet profound beneficial element that came from mysterious sparks or bolts of lightning from the gods left an indemnable imprint in Celtic religious practice. Fire was the ultimate sacrifice and a direct connection with the divine. Through this proverbial burning gate, humanity could reach the immortal. Perhaps remnants of this relationship with fire inspired the candles of the light churches, temples and altars around the world, but within and outside the Celtic legacy. In folklore, the name Bridget is often synonymous with fiery arrow, bright arrow or the bright one. Although the modern etymology points to the root of Brig simply meaning exalted, or Bridget meaning simply lady. Whether or not the nicknames are linguistically accurate, they are certainly descriptive of Bridget's personality. Fiery Arrow is a regularly used nickname for Bridget, conveying the flame that she is known for, or perhaps as an analogy for the rays of the sun. Spiritually, Bridget's fiery arrows are summoned for direction and striking the heart of the situation. The fiery aspect of Bridget encompasses swift change, powerful manifestations and a kind of spiritual internal combustion necessary for completion, drive and inspiration. Glimpses of Bridget as fire goddess are easily recognised in her incarnation as Saint Bridget. One myth of the child saint describes a time when the house in which she lived appeared to be on fire. Neighbours rushed to extinguish the flames, but on the arrival find there was no fire at all. They concluded that the Bridget was filled with the Holy Spirit, a kind of spiritual fire that empowered without destruction. If water is life's boat beginning and the salve of the wound is suffered, as well as the tempering of the hot iron of the forge, the bard is the inspiration for the creation. The sun and Bridget's connection with fire holds the space between the beginning and completion. In reflecting on Bridget as the sun is more reflection on the rays on the heavenly body. The rays are the physical connection from the source to the need and it is in the rays where Bridget is connected to the sun as seen in the story of hanging her cloak on the sunbeam which we told um, in the last video. Likewise Bridget the fire goddess connects us where we begin and where we hope or need to go. Best of all the flame is perpetual. Without a doubt Bridget's most famous flame can be found in the village of Kildare located in the province of Leinster. There's a shrine to Bridget, holds a perpetually burning flame. The area is believed to have originated as a pagan shrine and the original flame tended by 19 druidesses. This was a place where, where they supposedly never admitted men into the sanctuary and the perpetual flame never produced ash. The sanctuary was pretended by a, a virgin priestess and the leader was always called Bridget, but likely in form as the Bridget, indicating her leadership role more so than her name. The idea of a virgin priestess did not necessarily mean that these women spent their li entire lives without ever knowing sexual experiences. Rather, they did not associate regularly with men so that their entire lives could be devoted to supporting the shrine, which is believed to promote the fertility of the land, rather than divert their energies to pregnancy and child rearing. Any child born to these women was likely sent off for fostering by other women in the region. Nineteen priestesses tended the perpetual fire, the number possibly corroborating with the 19-year cycle of the Celtic Great Year. Each priestess would take a night to sit with the fire and tend it. On the 20th night, the fire would be left for the goddess to tend by herself. The 19th priestess would say to the shrine, Bridget, charge your own fire for this night belongs to you. When the area became Christianized, the tradition continued. When 19 nuns watched in the flame. On the 20th night, the flame was left alone for St. Bridget to tend. Bridget, tend your flame, the 19th nun would say, for the 20th night is yours. 
The practice of Kildare continued up until Reformation, when along with many Catholic practices were suppressed for their decidedly pagan elements. A shrine for the original fire temple exists where the original was believed to be, and in the late 20th century the Bridge of Flame was relit by the modern-day Brigantine sisters in Kildare, and a monument to the perpetual flame was erected in the town square. While the temple remains a point of pilgrimage for lovers of Bridget, the flame itself is kept in a nearby cottage and tended by the local Brigantine sisters, an order of nuns devoted to St. Bridget. If our sacred flames of Kildare are a clue to the goddess's mysteries, they are not encompassed endurance and eternal legacy. Bridget has been associated with other goddesses, such as the Hindu Kali or the Egyptian Shekmet, for their associations with the sun and fire. But unlike these other fire goddesses, Bridget's fire um, represents the product of fire rather than consumption or destruction by it. While there is certainly a place and need for destruction by fire, forests rely on periodic burnings for their health, this is not the role of Bridget's flame. Perhaps this is why the Kildare flame was never to have extinguished or created ashes. If ashes is what remains when other things are consumed, Bridget's ashless fire reminds us that progress and growth does not have to be dependent on consumption and destruction. Perhaps a better bridge of fire symbol than even the legendary Wickerman fires could be the burning candle on the writing table. And the flame and the lantern are the fire in the heart. The modern equivalents might include the furnace or the, bar or the boiler. It is in this sentiment that the world needs Bridget's fire, and sun, more than ever. The Chevalier Cathedral dedicated to St. Bridget is nearly a thousand years old, and at this time of this video has yet to build a bathroom faculty, but is entirely powered by solar panels. A contemporary manifestation of Bridget's direction of the power of fire into production without destruction. Bridget's fire is akin to the soul's internal fire, what we crave, what we desire, and what we must endure. As a flame that never dies or destroys, Bridget's fire motivates and leads. Seeking Bridget's fire is a journey, not only to manifest our deepest desires, it calls to us a question, what kind of legacy we want to leave? As in a symbolic act of burning our names into permanent structures, what image will our names leave behind? Bridget's water mysteries may be about knowing and healing the self and, and her bardic mysteries express the self, but the fire mysteries extend beyond the self. No act for the self can embody the spirit of Bridget if it leaves nothing for those who will never know your own self. What flames can we light that will continue our legacy? What ideas can we inspire that will stimulate long after our names have been forgotten? It's a daunting idea, but like the flame of Kildare that endures in a tiny candle, so can the tiniest, simplest motions set today endure forever. The fireplace of Bridget is depicted in the Smith Worker. Our contemporary world, few people have much or if any access to blacksmith's shop. Industry and invention may have removed the Smith trade from its previous role as a central sorry, technological turbine of industry. But in Bridget's early days, the Smith's work was from fundamental importance. The importance of iron in the ancient Celtic world cannot be underestimated. The only remote co comparison we may be able to wrap our, hands, hands, sorry, wrap our heads around is the development of the computer and its effect on the world, but it still doesn't quite do it justice. The development of work with iron uh, ore it literally launched the Celts entire civilization from a time of collection of scattered tribes to the major economic and cultural force of its time. The process of smith working originated in the Far East, but the natural abundance of iron ore in the Celtic area of Europe made it possible for this technology to grow and boost an entire world from its bellows and anvil. While the Celts remained eclectic uh, even after its development, iron was the main unifying factor in the Celtic world, essentially what made the Celts into the Celts. The new technology allowed advanced transportation through chariots, better weaponry through swords and axes. These tools allowed the Celts to engage in trade and provide advantages in warfare, which included pillaging and plundering their Roman neighbours. The things certainly had economic advantages and made for a prosperous Celtic world. Iron was more than a tool, it was a whole new way of living. The smithy was a centrepiece of social and cultural activity. Generally located in the centre of a settlement, town or village, patrons would bring their tools for mending, along with orders for nails or other instruments of work. The smithy was a general hub of information or news. This is true even today. 
The work cultivated in an aura of otherworldly power. The smith transformed seemingly useless metallic ore into something extremely powerful and useful, in an item not found naturally. The smithy stayed dimly lit so that the smith could best see the colours of the metal and the fire change, which would define when it was time to strike and shape the iron. The dark environment gave their shop another world of mystery. Smiths guarded the secrets of their work carefully, mostly to avert potential competition. To learn the secrets of smithing, one began as a child, sweeping the floor and tending needs of the shop. The process from apprentice to journeyman to master required decades akin to the study of druids required for their own mastery. In the darkened room where the fires and the bellows blew green smoke, the prism of blue, gold and white flame and the astounding transformation of the raw, cold iron into strong, usable material, it is easy to see why the smith was viewed as a magical worker. Iron even had a role of particular significance in averting evil spirits, possibly harking back to even an earlier time when the iron-wheeling Celts overtook their Bronze Age peers. Iron found its way into brooches, pins and amulets. Women in childbirth safeguarded their labouring space with a row of nails or iron reaping hook so that the evil spirits would not approach them or their infants. Although Smith working is traditionally work performed by men due to its reliance on upper body strength, Bridges' relationship uh, to it raises a question as to whether women were occasionally worked in the forge as well. In many myths, Bridges is credited with bringing Smith work to the world, but she is not the only Smith in the vast Celtic pantheon. The Irish god Gobnu is often called the Smith. The theory argues that Bridget originally sold originated solely as Brigantia and came to Ireland with the refugee British Druids, so often argues that the Irish Druids looking for space for new goddess in their pantheon moved existing smith deities aside. Yet, as Bridget was equally as likely to have already been in Ireland, she may have might have been in jurisdiction of the smithy at all. The great truth again comes back to the idea of exalted and the idea of feminine spirit embodying sacred elements. Brig, Lady of the Smith and Forge breathed life in its most important technology and through its spirit, the people thrived. If the importance of smithing of the Celts is any clue, Bridget the Smith might have a better term the goddess of work that changes the course of human evolution. Bridget Smith worker radically changes that paradigm. The hammer on the anvil is more, is more than a symbol. It is an action revolutionising the status quo. Calling upon the fire aspect of Bridget will purge, shape and purify and will leave all the touches radically changed for the better. The work of the blacksmith is all about control, compression and stretching. It requires the same amounts of heat, sweat and concentrated effort. The smith prepares the raw ore first by exposing to a brilliant hot force. The extreme temperatures soften the metal. When it reaches the proper softness, the metal is moved to the anvil where it is pounded and shaped as desired, starting the interaction between the form and function, achieving the strength and shape that the smith desires. The smith watches the metal carefully so it softens but never melts, and therefore is never destroyed. The process removes the impurities of the metal that has previously weakened it, leaving the finished product strong, durable and capable for the work that is designed. The heat and the hammer flake away weaker pieces of the metal. After a number of rounds of heating and pounding, the smith would eventually give the metal a cooling plunge into the water, but never before the work is complete. It is probably not a huge surprise that this work in line is what Bridget's works will do for practitioners. Bridget the smith will be called Bridget the soul pounder. Some cov covens call this debacle of tears, rage, continually hair pulling and eventual calm and inevitable strength. The stretch of the anvil, it is a time of testing, pressure and compression in the way that it ships the smith shapes metal. Throughout our lives we pick up bad habits, we cling to painful relationships, we mould ourselves into unnatural shapes. In a sense we create our own toxic prisons that we come to believe shelter us or strengthen us. The trials of Bridget's anvil include the crumbling of the walls we worked so desperately to build, relationships we helped we wept to keep, poor health habits we defended, even obligations we insisted on keeping. Like the impurities shed under the smith's hammer, Bridget pounds away our impurities. It is not an easy process. It's easy to want to cling on to what is comforting, no matter if it's something unhealthy or unnatural. But one rule about magic, one of my teachers often says that when the first thing it changes is the self. Bridget's transform of magic works comes in the very disguised form of symbolic anvil and hammer. 
After the metal has been heated and shaped, the process work is far from over. The metal cools, cracks and settles. Its colour settles on the surface, but its internal system takes longer. After Bridget's Anvil, our eternal lives may be radically different, but our hearts and souls take longer to settle. It opens a whole new level of fears, insecurities and other unnecessaries that gain that again need to be pulled out, reforged, rehammered and recooled. In the end of the Smith's process, the coal burns out and the specks of metal melted from the ore fall to the bottom of the forge, where it becomes a waste product called clinker. Its use is a smith and in some ways it mirrors what we discard in the process of Bridget's anvil. Yet, we look at a piece of strange... The strange priest of clinker, previously black coal, burnt white and looking like mutilated piece of salt. A passerby can mention that a clinker was like a component of new, um, bi- new budding planets. After stars explode, they release a clinker-like product through space, which eventually comes together with other clinker pieces to create a new space body. I don't know if there's much truth about that and how much interplanetary geology I'm actually missing, but in a spiritual sense, however, maybe it's possible that what we throw away in our own anvil process has room for growth and expansion somewhere else, but in a new form. One can imagine an anvil, look at pictures or browse the internet for videos and articles. One can also visualise, visualise, visualise until the centre of the mind melts. But one cannot know what an anvil is about until one has been uh, to it, smelt the coal and the hot metal touched it and heard the ring of the hammer strike down on the, on the road. There are times when of the hammer and metal seems so natural that the hammer seems to be an extension of the arm, but it can spark and sting, which reminds you to be diligent and vigilant. This is true of the spiritual anvil as well. The whole intention of the smith is to create strength in the material that he or she works with. The ability to wield metal thicker and stronger was the essential hallmark of the master smith. This also is the role of Bridget the smith. The pain and stress that may come when invoking Bridget the Smith is invariably intentionally part of the process of strengthening the soul. Some people may never experience the anvil. They may never need it. Some may enjoy the process. Others may descend through the fires to even deeper mysteries. If you feel yourself in a pressurised chaotic journey while working with Bridget, take heart. She is working to make you stronger. Now, what has made you stronger or wiser? Where have you been stretched and pounded? Where have you grown and what parts do you consider iron fortified? Durable, usable as a result of your own trials. Consider also what parts you are chipped away with your own anvil moments. Did it take on a new life elsewhere, in the way of the smithy's clinker might? In the following myth, it is Gubnu that holds the role of the smith god, but the work of the smithy and Bridget's own subsequent anvil moments explores the power of flame and fire to permanently change. Nuwada, the king with a silver hand, could not sit on the throne of the two of the dawn because he was missing a hand, one re- replaced with silver. This meant he was blemished, and according to the two of the dawn and law, was unfit to rule his people. No other potential king was present, and so to fill the role and unify the people of the sky with the people of the ocean, the two of the dawn summoned Brez of the sea people, the Fomorians, to be their leader. As a chosen king, his leadership unified a bond between the former enemies. To seal this arrangement and strengthen the union, Bridget agreed to marry Bress. Together they had three sons. Bress began his reign as a good leader and all the people of the sea and the sky were happy. But slowly at first and greatly, Bress taxed the children of Dana. He claimed all milk from all cattle, all grain from each field and all sparks from each fire. Gods of old renown were forced to labour in the fields until they dropped from exhaustion. No one could fulfil their duties and the people starved. Bridget kept her silence lest to tempt her husband's ar- anger and incite more disaster for her people. When Brez became bored and greedy and began to think of new ways to extort Dana's children further, Bridget would brew beer, sing songs and share tales until her husband fell into deep sleep. While he napped, Bridget gathered cheese and bread into her green cloak and shared the food with her starving people. In time, fortified by the strength of Bridget provided, the two of the Donan planned an attack. They cast a spell and chanted the words, Sinew to sinew and nerve to nerve, and repaired Nuada's hand. The new flesh restored, led by the rightful king, Brez was overthrown and sent back to the ocean, taking all the sons he had by Bridget with him. Bridget paced along the shore, as she could not go with her sons and her father into the depths of the sea, but stayed at the place of the shore and sea met, lest either her children or her people need her. 
The two of the Donner grew strong, and with their strength, Bress's anger grew too. He, along with his Fomorian people, returned from the sea to fight the two of to reclaim the throne. But the two of the Donner soldiers had magical weapons. No matter how their swords and spears splintered, they were made anew at dawn the next day. Irae Brez called Fort Rudan, the eldest son he shared with Bridget, to seek the secrets of the Tua's magical renewing metal. Dressed as a Tua warrior, Rudan came out of the sea and met Gubnu, the smith, working inside Luktana, the carpenter, and Credna, the bronze worker. He watched how the three worked together before returning to his father's people. Rudan shared the stories of the weaponry metal fixed so adroitly that they never need rehammering or repair or any cooperation of men, their skill and their generosity. Bress sent him back to Tua, this time to kill Gubnu. Rodon approached the smith again and asked for a javelin, which Gubnu gave without question. Rodon thrust the spear through Gubnu's breast, a blow that would have killed the strongest of men and gods. Yet the old smith plucked the weapon from his breast like the tiniest of splinters and hurled it back to his assailant. Rodon was mortally wounded and he limped back to the sea to die. As their son lay on the shoreline, his li- life leaving this world, Bridget and Brez mourned together, the sound of their cries piercing the stormy air across the land. Their weeping would henceforth be known as keening, and it's this great act of mourning that is known as the adventure of Bridget's, Bridget's from the time she lost her son to the treachery and greed. For all her spunk and duality, Bridget was no stranger to pain or sorrow or straddling stressful situations to make peace. I must admit, I look... I, I, look, I took a bit of poetic license with the story above. The myths I found about Bridget and Brez marry when Bridget disappears from the story until Rudan's death and then she invents keening in her grief. This seems odd and unlikely so such a resourceful goddess would stand idly while her husband created massive chaos and let her people suffer. Yet she was in a tough position. Perhaps she loved Brez. Perhaps she only stayed with him for political reasons or protect her children. In this story, Bridget involves the all-too-human experience of watching loved ones make terrible mistakes, of needing to walk a fine line between argumentative parties and of making selfless sacrifices for the betterment of others. Ultimately, Bridget embodies this element of pain so great it cannot be spoken, only screamed. As with Anvil and Forge, Bridget had again invented mechanisms for coping with suffering, keening. Keening was nearly a lyrical type of wailing performed in honour of the dead. It had been described as deeply per- personal and cathartic expression in which the wailing would move others into space until all present would wail the point of frenzy. This practice was outlawed by the Catholic Church in the mid-1800s. Some say the pagan nature of keening triggered the Church's distaste. For well over a century, keening was pretty much obsolete and relegated to folklore and works of fiction. Because of its intimate nature and dissolution before recording equipment was easily accessible, examples of old-world keening are tough to find, but they can be, if they can be found at all. Yet the practice may be returning. Keeners appear at funeral or ancestral rites, but as also at political demonstrations. It's a stretch called grief a gift, but there is a gift in the method of coping with sorrow. Giving out voice for sadness and pain, be it through a chorus of wails or another cathartic method such as words are in a page, is a type of bridges work. Fire in the physical world is of principal importance. We must have fire, but fire can injure and destroy as well. The symbolic idea of fire is associated with creation, drive and passion, but the strenuous powers of fire can be forgotten or glossed over. Like the fires of the forge, the light in the temple, or our internal flames of desire, spiritual fire must be tended. Sometimes, though, we run out of fuel. Spiritual flames remind us that we can rely on the cooperation of others. Keeping the flame lit in the shrine of Kildare required cooperation on behalf of the bridge's priestesses and later her nuns. Yet, in the 19th night, the tender of the flame will surrender the work to Bridget as part of the community had been exhausted. Bridget was expected to step in and complete the work on the 20th night. When we reach points of trouble and complications in our journeys, and we finally exhaust all we're able to do, this is the point in which we can call on the help of the Divine. We can keep pushing or we can surrender our trying and striving and ask Bridget to tend the, our flames. When you've reached a point to tasking a part in your journey in which you have nothing more to improve a situation either internally or outside of you and you wish for Bridget's help and rest, the following is a suggested ritual for doing this work. Now what you need for this is 20 votive or tea like candles, a freshly cored apple and an image or written description of the trouble you wish to surrender. Now, start this ritual when you have sufficient time and quiet. Light 19 candles in a circle. Leave one candle unlit in the centre of the circle with the apple next to it. 
as the 90 candles burn, reflect on your period of difficulty. Think of what you're trying to You've tried to do to fix the situation, acknowledging mistakes made along the way and also things that are outside of your control. While again in this space you might find inspiration of new approaches to your task, then again you may not. The objective here is to surrender. When you're ready to surrender your trouble, write it down on the piece of paper. If you are able to print a photo of said trouble, write, I surrender this on the picture. Roll up the message of the picture into a scroll and insert it into the cord apple. Extinguish all flames and light one, the one in the centre and say aloud. Bridget, mother of flame, fire and forge. In the heat and the darkness, I seek patience in the tightness. I seek peace in the kiln. I seek compassion in the strife. Create in me the quiet well of night. As I surrender may I, my tasks to you, Bridget, the 19 nights have been tended. Bridget, now be the 20th night of my soul's journey. Bridget, tend your flame. You may want to speak out other petitions for help at this point. Stay with the, ca the candle while it burns out. When the rite ends, or on the following day, bury the apple or toss it into a river or a stream with the paper still inside it. This is a simple but highly effective practice with Bridges Flame, which is designed to re-energise when personal resources are low or to simply better connect you with Bridges Flame. Now what you need this are five small white candles, tea lights or votives. Now you'll also need Bridges Oil. Now Bridges Oil we will talk about later on in the tent video. Anoint each candle and wick with the Bridget Oil. Set the candles in secure holders or on flame resistant dishes. Light and arrange them so that while you are lying on the floor that there is one candle above your head, one to your right hand, one to your left and one at each of your feet. While in this position, envision each of these candles emanating a powerful white light that does not consume, but connects each part of you from where you lie and fuses with your physical structure. See this white light travel through your limbs and head, and how each beam of light connects at your, to your heart. Begin to see the white light pulse with each of your heartbeats. Envision your heartbeat is the clink of the hammer of, or on the anvil. With each pound, envision that the eternal flame, symbolised by the five candles, is travelling through your body and linking with your heart. Stay in this position until the light seems to create glowing bars of iron from each flame, glowing brightly to where they meet at your heart. This is not the space to overthink. Some fall into deep sleep. Give yourself plenty of time in this position. When you feel ready, conclude the rite and extinguish the candles.